Hi there, I'm Jen. This is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a wrap-up of some recent reads. Hopefully a quick one, because I turned off the air conditioning for this, and it is unpleasantly warm today. So we'll see how quickly I can do this. Um, what are you going to start with? All right, so first up, I read Roz Chast Going Into Town, A Love Letter to New York. Roz Chast is the author of Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant, which is basically the cream of the crop of elderly relative in decline memoirs, which doesn't sound like it should be a genre, but it very much is. This, in contrast, is a much lighter book. It started out as a helpful pamphlet that she put together for her one of her kids who was going to university in New York City and was going to be living in Manhattan. And she grew up in Brooklyn and kind of moved to, I don't know, Connecticut or one of these places that's sort of, uh, what is it, not suburbs? exurbs. She raised her kids outside of the city, so she started as a guide and then it evolved into this book. It is her typical art style. If you read The New Yorker, you'll probably have also seen her cartoons. And it's a nice enough book. I think a lot of people who either grew up in New York and left or grew up somewhere else and moved to New York will probably enjoy this. This is the kind of book that I'm definitely going to give away to someone I know who spends his weekends in New York City, just because I feel like that's the market for it. Reading it, I thought, okay, I see what she's going for, but I don't think I'm the target market for this, and I thought it was fine. But for the right people, I think that's top notch. Next up, let's talk about some poetry. I listened to the audio versions of two poetry collections, the first of which was Jericho Brown's The Tradition, which is narrated by J.D. Jackson. And that should have been a warning sign for me that this wasn't going to be my kind of thing, because in general, I have the same issue with poetry that's read by someone else that I have with memoirs that are read by someone other than the author, um, in that a lot of the time you don't know if the emphasis is being put in the right place. And I think with a lot of historical poetry, for example, especially ones that are based on rhyme or meter and whatnot, where there's kind of a defined rhythm to the language, that isn't an issue. So if you listen to something that was rhyming poetry written a hundred years ago, that doesn't matter if someone else is doing a dramatic reading of it. But with modern poetry, it's always a little bit off, and this is a very personal book. It is dealing with the personal on a variety of levels, from everything from being human to being a U.S. American to being black to being queer to being HIV positive and uh, to being a parent to being religious all of that, exploring kind of all of those ways of being and things. So it's extremely personal, but then read by someone who isn't the author. And for me, at least, that's always very distracting because when the narrator is then putting emphasis on certain bits or certain lines or certain words over something else, it does make you wonder, is that what the author would have done? And is that the intent? So it's almost a performance piece that is in addition to the original which is something you don't have when you are listening to something that's narrated by the author themselves. So I found that distracting, but I know that not everyone has that experience. So I just want to put that out there, that it did have an impact on my enjoyment, but it might not have an impact on yours. The next poetry collection that I listened to was read by the author, and that was Roya Marsh's Daylight. This is a really interesting collection in that it deals a lot with repetition. So I think on the page, it would have had pages that are all a single word or a single phrase, but in the audio it's almost like the author is is pounding the single words uh, in a really interesting way so th in between poems that are actual text. There's also bits that are found poetry, things about uh, gun ownership from Facebook, things about, a again, a lot of different elements of identity, talking about femaleness and blackness and queerness and grief and cultural what is it, the cultural expressions of certain political things, which is all really interesting. Um, this is a pretty short one. I found both the content uh, and, the, and the performance to be really compelling, especially the bits of found poetry, because I think with a lot of found poetry, you're looking at the curation, and I thought the curation in those particular poems was really uh, compelling as well. So yeah, good stuff. Next up, I have a short story collection. This is Taina by Nora Dunning. The subheading on this is actually The Unseen One and Other Stories. This is a collection of short stories that mostly deal with uh, Inuit characters living in Alberta and mostly deals with 
family relationships and relationships between people. It opens with a story about a woman and her two kids going to meet her sister, who she's been estranged from for a while, and looking back at their family traumas. There's another one that is two characters next to a river and the ghost of the grandfather of one of them, or the spirit of the grandfather, and an evil spirit are kind of fighting over which one of them they're going to push into the river. And that's really interesting. This is a book that won the Governor General's Award. And given that, I was surprised that it wasn't... <laughs> this is going to sound terrible. I was surprised that it wasn't more pretentious feeling than that. This does feel very much like you could read this in a book club and have good discussions without anybody not bothering to read it, not just because it's short, but I feel like there are a lot of the prize winners that, at least with some of these Canadian prizes, where the most pretentious thing wins, and that clearly wasn't the case with it. Is that mean? Do I feel like a lot of Canadian short story writers are trying too hard? That's possible. Um, in any case, I think as a collection, this wasn't the best thing I've ever read, but I do think it was overall of solid and consistent quality because I think with a lot of short story collections the problem is the highs are high but the lows are low and this was pretty consistent all the way through. All that said I don't know how memorable all of this was because I did I read this in the park last week and I honestly don't remember much of the rest of it although I enjoyed it as I was reading it and so I think there's definitely value to that. All right, next up we'll talk about some of the nonfiction. maybe. I read Witold Sablowski's How to Feed a Dictator. This was translated by Antonia Lloyd-Jones, and this is interesting. It's a piece of journalism slash oral history in which the author goes and interviews the personal chefs or cooks of a variety of dictators, from Iraq to Albania to Uganda to Cambodia to Cuba. And it's really interesting. For the most part, each country gets a single chapter, but the Cambodian chef uh, has reminiscences and recipes that are interspersed throughout all of the other chapters before we hear her story at the end. And that's a really interesting device because aside from her, all of the other chefs are fairly realistic about who they were working for and they enjoyed getting the benefits of working for a dictator. They a lot of them had nice clothes and nice cars, and when various people were deposed then they lost a lot of the things. But a lot of them were fearing for their lives and are very realistic about both the, the pros and the cons of the kind of position that they were in. Whereas this woman who cooked for Pol Pot is very, oh, he couldn't have possibly committed this genocide that the entire world knows happened and that Cambodia itself, you know, is very open about. And when you travel there, um, you were very much encouraged to go to the various genocide sites and, and I mean at, at one of them they were almost saying take more pictures because people need to know about this. So that she's the one in denial I thought was really interesting. I also thought the one uh, about the cook who worked, a, a pair of cooks who worked for Fidel Castro was really interesting because as dictators go and as some of these other people go, he, I mean at least being somebody who lives in Canada, where I think we have more positive attitudes towards Cuba in general than, say, people in the U.S. do, um, it is really interesting how they talk about uh, their relationship to the regime and um, and what one can say or not, especially one of the cooks seems to be in the early stages of dementia. So that's really interesting. And the cook who'd been in Uganda is actually Kenyan originally and has a like connection by marriage to uh, Barack Obama's family and so that's all really interesting. Um, so there are great bits and pieces and with each chapter we get the author describing how he found these people and how he how long it took for him to convince people to talk to him because a lot of these people are in hiding and also uh, some of provide some additional context to stories that they tell which are maybe not the official story or, or maybe a a bit off from the official story. So this was just great fun is maybe not the best thing to talk about because a lot of these people are working for people who committed genocide, but it is really interesting. And also there are recipes that you could cook. So <laughs> there you go. If you want to make Saddam Hussein's favorite fish soup, you can do that after you read this book. Yeah. So that was really interesting. And finally, I read Asha Jabbar's Algerian White which is translated by David Kelly. 
this is really interesting because it is a writer talking about writers, but talking about them from the perspective of where they stand in the political life of Algeria from the French period through to when she was writing this in the early 90s, which was during the early days of the Algerian Civil War, which was 91 to 2002. So she starts out and she's talking about writers who were working during the French period and writers who were pied noir or writers who were writers who considered themselves Arab versus writers who considered themselves Amazite and so on. But as she goes on, she ends up talking about writers who were assassinated right at the beginning of the Civil War in the 90s and how many of them didn't think that they would be uh, targets for that because they considered themselves primarily poets and not political journalists and was there propaganda out there and is that a kind of storytelling that's out there as well. So that's all really interesting. She talks a lot about how regardless of what language people write in, basically nobody writes no one's writing in local dialect. So, so if somebody writes in Arabic, they're writing in modern standard Arabic. If they're writing in French, they're writing in metropolitan French and how few people write in Amazite at all. And what does that mean if you're always using this foreign language? And she talks quite a bit about how she and another writer who have very different regional and class related accents, if they're speaking Algerian Arabic, but if they default to French or if they default to modern standard Arabic, it erases all of that. And is there power to erasing those differences or is there it a shame to be erasing those differences and how complicated that can be. So this is all really interesting, I think, especially for anyone in countries where there is uh, rising political divisions. I think a lot of the discussion about what was happening specifically in the early 90s is really interesting just because there are so many people in this who were killed. I mean, in, in, as she says in one of them with a smile on his face because they just never thought that they had gotten to that point. They didn't think that there was a civil war that was about to break out. And I think that's a really interesting perspective. Um, and also because this was written 27 years ago, we do have the perspective of how long this war lasted and everything else that happened in the meantime, which is an interesting framing to have outside of it. So yeah, I think this is top notch. Um, Reading it, there were only a couple of the writers that she talked about that I knew of or had read, so it's a really interesting starting point from that perspective as well. All right, it is now getting too hot, so I'm gonna wrap this up. Uh, if you've read any of these, I'd love to hear what you thought. And do you have a favorite book that is writers talking about other writers? I would love to hear that. And yeah, that's it for now. Ciao.